tough questions. Each week, we seek to answer one difficult question that's relevant to churchgoers and Christians. And this week, we're going to jump right in. The question is, what is the gospel? I've had the opportunity to ask this question to quite a few teenagers and adults who go to church regularly, who claim to be Christians. And I'm always surprised how difficult and how tough of a question this is for people to answer. So we're going to be answering that today, as well as the question of, can you be a Christian if you don't understand the gospel? And have you personally ever shared the gospel to anyone? Right now, we're going to take a brief uh, intermission and hear a message from our sponsors. Is talking on the phone getting out of hand? Look out! You need phone relief. The ultimate in hands-free phone design. Watch. Simply attach the special bubble back fastener to any phone. Then attach the phone relief headset. It's that easy. Hands-free, pain-free. You'll wonder how you ever lived without it. It's perfect for remotes. Now talk hands-free anywhere, anytime. Office work is a pain for Mr. Phone in the Neck, but you won't miss a beat with hands-free freedom. A must for the entire office. Work goes quicker and easier. The padded headset removes this easily and is fully adjustable. Best of all, Phone Relief works with your favorite phone, an amazing breakthrough product you'll use every day. Now only $12.95. Call toll-free to order by credit card and make this your last phone in the neck call. Call now, 1-800-862-1000. Our operators are giving tremendous discounts on additional units. That's 1-800-862-1000. Or send check or money order to the address on your screen. Sorry, no CODs. Credit card users, call now, 1-800-862-1000. All right, guys, only $12.95. You can't even get it on Amazon anymore. We need to bring this product back. Uh, just kidding. Um, back to the lesson. I'd like to show a video now from The Bible Project, a resource I recommend, BibleProject.com, or their YouTube channel, The Bible Project. Uh, this is a, a video on the gospel of the kingdom. There's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger. And he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? that despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. Yeah, so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the Gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, a powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside down kingdom. Now Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high ranking Roman officer and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. 
Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people, forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. So how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. Well, that was a great video. It does help us answer the question, what is the gospel? Of course, simply put, it the word gospel means good news. But if we answer that question, what is the gospel? And all we say is, well, it means good news. Euangelion is the Greek word. Well, that's a good answer, but it's probably not a complete answer. And so um, there are a couple ways to look at this. What is the gospel or what are the gospels? One way is it's the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are considered the Gospels. But the Gospel is the good news about Jesus, the good news that the kingdom of God has come near, that salvation is offered to humanity through the forgiveness of sins, through the sacrifice of Jesus' own body, through his blood cleansing us. But I want to read Isaiah 52. It was quoted in the video. It says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So there you have an Old Testament uh, idea and foundation for the concept of the gospel or the good news coming to humanity. Um, I want to read a quote. This is a quote uh, about the Great Commission written by Justin Martyr in uh, 160 A.D., so one of the early uh, Christians, uh, or church fathers as, as some call him, uh, he said this, From Jerusalem, 12 men went out into the world. These were uneducated and of no ability in speaking. But by the power of God, they proclaimed to every race of men that they were sent by Christ to teach the word of God to everyone. So we already said gospel means good news. Euangelion is a Greek word. But a simple way, I want this to be a simple lesson, a simple way to remember this in one easy Bible passage is 1 Corinthians 15. So you just go to 1 Corinthians 15, remember this, verse 1, and, in, and read verses uh, 1 through 8, and that will be a very clear communication of what the gospel is. And then, you know, how, how we act it out, how we live it out, how we respond to it as well. So let's read it. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also 
as one abnormally born. I thought that's a, a good passage to go to when you're trying to communicate the gospel very simply and effectively. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. So how do we respond to the gospel? Well, the Bible is pretty clear that we need to have a, a, a full understanding of what the gospel is and how people responded to it in Scripture. So Romans 10 says, well, of course, we have to hear it first. So how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ, Romans 10. So first we must hear. Then, of course, believe. You know, it's very clear that the way we live our lives is evidence of our beliefs. So if someone says to you, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and perhaps you ask them, okay, well, what's your favorite thing that Jesus said? What's the, you know, the, the Bible verse you remember the most about Jesus? And if that person said, well, I don't think I know anything that Jesus said, would you believe them? Uh, one time I was eating dinner with a football player, a high school student, and he said he was uh, going to play football at a Christian school. And I said, oh, that's awesome, man. What uh, is, you know, are you a Christian? He said, yeah. And then he, and then I said, hey, well, what's your favorite quote from Jesus? And he said, well, I don't know. I don't think I know any of the words of Jesus. And this might sound harsh, but I said to them, I said to him, I don't know if I can believe you that you are a Christian if you don't even know a single word that Jesus said. Not trying to be harsh, but how could you believe in something that you can't even talk about, right? Romans 10 says this as well. The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Of course, I think that's clear that it, we have to hear it. And then, of course, if you don't believe it, then you couldn't possibly be a Christian. And then what mentioned in Romans 10, I think we, we see again this concept of profession or giving a confession of your faith. Uh, it's also uh, emphasized in Acts 8 as well when uh, Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch and he says, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with your heart, with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's his profession or his confession of faith. And then, of course, uh, the next step in responding to the gospel would be to repent. Uh, one thing that's very clear in the gospel is that Jesus tells everyone to repent. So what does it mean to repent? To do a 180, to make a U-turn in your life. If you were committing some type of sin, you would stop in that sin and turn around and go the opposite direction. John 8 says, you know, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the message to all of us, that we are to all uh, repent of our sins, which means to live a life that is different than living a life in sin. For example, if you were one who was stealing, you must do that no more. And you do something beneficial with your hands, as, as the book of Ephesians says. And then, of course, baptism would be included in how you respond to the gospel. Romans 6 and many other passages in the New Testament um, would affirm that, well, if you, if you hear it and you believe it and you profess it and you repent, well, the next step would clearly be baptism. And baptism is not something that is a magical process. Uh, Water is not special. The person baptizing you uh, isn't a magic uh, healer type person. It's just the obedience that is uh, being lived out here. It's the moment in which we say, yes, God, I want you to take control. And by, bab by the, this baptism, going back to the 1 Corinthians 15 passage, we're reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You may have heard that before. But Romans 6 says this, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? 
Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I want to read this. This is from uh, 325 AD when um, there was much debate about who Christ was and how uh, the church was going to be unified on the message of the gospel. And they, they wrote down this statement. And I think this is a very powerful statement. By the way, all Christian denominations agree on these things, except the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, and maybe a few others. Um, these are the biggies of the faith, if you will. And uh, I want to read this because I think this is very encouraging and essential that we believe the correct things about what the gospel is, about who Jesus is, and about how salvation takes place. So can you be a Christian and not know what the gospel is? The answer is clearly no. And um, we are called to share this gospel. But here's what it says. This is a summary. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, of all that is seen and unseen, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and he was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And I hope that you can say amen to this passage. These are the core essential doctrines of Christianity. If you claim to be a Christian, from reading scripture, you would agree on these on this statement here. But I want to make it even simpler than that. I want you to um, open your hand, uh, choose one of your hands, open it up, hold it in front of your face, open up your palm. And um, I want you to think about this. What are the five steps of, in which we can you know, respond to the gospel? I just want to share them simply by using your fingers. Here's a simple way. If you can't remember this and you can't remember all these Bible verses, remember these. Hold out your thumb and say, hear, believe, profess or confess repent and be baptized. It's pretty simple, right? You know, these are the ways that you respond to the gospel. And then if you want to take it a step further with your other hand, you could uh, hold out your other hand. And these are the core doctrines. So not just how you respond, but the core doctrines or the essentials, the biggies of what all Christians believe and what we must all believe in order to be a Christian and in order to share the gospel with others. Here's what what they are. These are essential. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is Lord. That God, who is one, is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the concept of the Trinity as found throughout all the Old Testament and New Testament. That Jesus was a real person, that he died, he was buried and raised. The church is the body of Christ. That sins are forgiven in Christ at baptism and that all the doctrine of that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then, of course, what you do is you would clench, you know, you make an action here. You would clench your fist. So go ahead and clench your fist and say that God gives his Holy Spirit and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit after baptism. And then, of course, at the end, you would open your fist and throw your hand up and say that the dead in Christ will be raised, the hope of resurrection. This is what all Christians are waiting. And by the way, these are the biggies, the core doctrines of Christianity that you can remember on one single hand. So I encourage you guys to remember those. They're very awesome. I want to close with this video. This is by Dave Bowden, and uh, it's called I Believe in Jesus.
I believe in Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, the prelude to Adam, the author of Eden, by all, in all, through all, Genesis reason, the husband of the newborn bride. I believe earth is one of his love's brightest beacons. I believe in Jesus, the infant king, ruler of the heavens, the universe's spring, and yet he took the frailest of forms, the weakest of things, for our mighty God was not too proud for the stable and trough of Bethlehem's sting. I believe in Jesus, the forgiver of men. Since man would not come to God, God came to them. Though we spit in his face through our arrogance and sin, holiness still became flesh so that it might be forgiven. I believe in Jesus, the perfection of the law, for creation was doomed by the requirements it scrawled. But he came not to abolish correction, but succeed where we did fall. And then he wrote a new law on our hearts. Love God and love all. I believe in Jesus, the horribly betrayed unknown by the world he himself had made, handed over to death by a follower to whom some silver was paid, disowned by a friend three times in one day. I believe in Jesus, the ever-turning cheek, no sword in his hand. He took the way of the weak, redefined strength as beaten and meek when men struck him on his back. Only forgiveness did he speak. I believe in Jesus, the servant on the cross. To save the lives of the sinful, he considered his own life lost, endured the torture of men, whips and nails in his flesh were embossed, received the righteous wrath of God, the judge bearing our judgment, the ultimate cost. I believe in Jesus and that flesh in the tomb. You see, he bore the end of a normal human as he was born of a human's womb. He died a criminal's death and was buried in some other man's room. God, the Son, lay dead, the lifeless groom. But I still believe in Jesus and the body of his resurrection, for he redefined life in death's final rejection as he showed holes in hands to over 500 of his own selection so that humanity would not be able to raise an objection to the fact that Jesus Christ is God the Son and has made the ultimate connection. So I believe in Jesus and the commissioning of his ascension. For he ascended to God's right hand forever in intercession, leaving his truth in the hands of a few, those first to be called his Christians. His hands and feet are now the church, his boundless, reconciling expression. This is our heritage. They are our relatives. And this, this is our confession. We believe in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. <laughs>